top of climate change, uh, we're seeing real problems with our insect populations and also with our bird populations as well, since birds rely on insects for most of their, not most of their lives. So uh, first off, plants are the basis of the ecosystem food web. Uh, of course, they supply food to uh, many insects, not all insects, because you do have your predators uh, that will feed on insects as well. Uh, baby birds must eat insects to live and flourish, but it's just not any insects. If you think about baby birds, what are they being fed? Well, most of the times it's caterpillars. And why caterpillars? Because they're big and fat and squishy and they can go down the throat of a baby bird easily. And the mom is you know, shoving these things down there just relentlessly. Uh, one thing we talk about in AWS when we do a visit, we always impress upon people uh, the number of caterpillars it takes to raise uh, like one clutch of baby birds. And with like chickadees, for instance, they takes six to 9,000 caterpillars over the course of say three weeks to get these birds out of the nest. So the importance of caterpillars is just incredible. And that's why uh, we, Ptolemy stresses something called keystone plants, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But uh, one thing, Arkansas insects cannot eat non-native plants. And if you have non-native plants, it means no insects. You don't have insects, especially caterpillars. You're not going to have the birds either. So I'd like to briefly define native for you. So a native plant uh, is going to imply a evolutionary relationship between species in a uh, particular locale. And it, when you say evolutionary relationship, you're talking about a deep time relationship. So it's, it takes thousands and thousands of years for these relationships to establish. And when you bring a non-native plant in, it does not have that relationship. So insects cannot eat these plants. And you can, I've got native or non-native azaleas in our yard and we go out there and look at them. They're, you know. The leaves that look great, which is probably why people plant them. You know, there's no uh, insects eating them and making them look bad. So if you plant native plants and you go outside and you say, man, that plant looks terrible. All the leaves have been eaten off. That's a good thing because it means it's being used and we're uh, supporting our insect diversity because insects run this world, our terrestrial ecosystem. Without insects, uh, in the words of uh, the great biologist E.O. Wilson, we descend into chaos. So we have to protect these, this vital component of our ecosystem. Uh, keystone plants, uh, keystone natives are considered plants that host the most species of caterpillars. And the best one that I can think of are oak trees. Oak trees support four to 500 species of caterpillars. In contrast, if you're into, if someone's into calorie pairs, it may host one species, maybe, but you know, leaves aren't used and as fast as they spread in the environment, they have become a real problem. Uh, they're pretty for a little while in the spring, but that's it. Uh, the last topic is specialist plants. Uh, specialist plants are kind of unique because they'll host maybe one caterpillar or a pollinator, and, but they're very important because without that, uh, Without these specialist plants, you know, you will lose the specialist caterpillars. The diversity in your yard will be much less. And diversity is really what it's about. You know, you, the more diverse you can make your area, the more stable your yard is. So just think diversity when you're planting your plants. Uh, Ptolemy has come up, is, there's a website at the bottom of this, Homegrown National Park. Uh, so I encourage you to look at that. It's, it's this, he, he can, I guess congeals all his principles into this. If all, if you look at the amount of turf grass in the United States, and if people will begin converting that tough turf grass into native habitat, uh, we can eventually grow a national park just in our own yards by linking our yards one to the other. And, uh, you know, you can consider yourself a land steward and not a homeowner. That's the way I like to look at it. Uh, his book, Nature's Best Hope, shown on the slide, is probably the best book that you can buy to kind of look at his conservation, but also YouTube has many videos about it as well. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Thank you. 
Sorry, I'm jumping ahead by mistake oh, there. That's, that's um, it, I was just going to um, add to that. If you're looking for any information on Ptolemy, um, Homegrown National Park is a, a, the, probably the best site to go to. When you go to that, there will be a little uh, link at the top to click on called Ptolemy Hub, and that will take you to his latest uh, YouTube presentations and also to, um, to this book that um, he wrote for the general public back in 2020. It was on the bestseller list for a while, and it's written for the general public. And if you don't know much about this area, it's a, an, a terrific starting place. Um, Anne, did you want to add anything? No, just that it is it is a, a an eye opener in 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 a really good way. So David, I was thinking as you were talking about how some of the principles of natural gardening run completely counter to gardening we may have done before. For example, that it's great if something is eating the leaves on your plants. Um, you know, we're all trained to think that that's terrible and to run out and buy spray to put on our plants to get rid of those horrible things that are eating the plants. But with natural gardening, that's what we want. And I'm happy when I go out and see something is eating my plants, as long as they are not completely destroying the plant so that it dies. Other than that, um, I'm very happy. So, yeah, it's, it's really a mindset change. It's just a different way to look at at your garden and what you're trying to accomplish. So just yeah. think habitat, so. Yes, the purpose is so different. So um, some of you know me from my past life as a law professor and as a law professor, um, I wrote many, 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 many multiple choice questions and also taught using an active learning teaching method. And so here's the first multiple choice question for tonight for you, our audience, which one of the following plants is a native Arkansas plant? Three of these are not, one of them is. And um, I would ask you not to write your answer in chat and yeah. give it away to everybody else. <laughs> so um, take a look at these and make your best guess. And the answer is, the Hercules Club tree. Um, daffodils are actually native to the Mediterranean, which uh, is surprising because we see so many daffodils around. In fact, that's one of the ways that you can tell where pioneers lived because they planted daffodils um, at their little cabin sites and the cabin is no longer there, but the daffodils are, but those daffodils aren't natives. Um, Forsythia, depending on the species, is native to either Eastern Europe or Eastern Asia. Um, crepe myrtles are native to China and Korea. Um, and people have asked me whether all of these other plants are natives at one time or another. Um, they're not. And before I became a master naturalist, I didn't have the foggiest idea about what was native and what was non-native beyond, you know, an occasional plant every now and then. Um, but to natural gardening, it's really, really important. Um, the Hercules club tree, um, Xanthoxylum clava herculis is its scientific name. Um, it and the prickly ash and the wafer ash are the only nat Arkansas native host plants of the giant swallowtail butterfly. Speaking of specialists, as you were just a minute ago, David, um, they, these trees, this species grow, grows wild in my yard. And right now they are hosting baby giant swallowtail caterpillars, which are crawling all over the leaves and eating them and getting bigger, even as we speak. So, um, so, Moving on, when we, uh, when we talk about um, fall and winter natural garden tasks, it all comes back to the purposes of a natural garden. And Anne, I think you're gonna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, I was just thinking, I would challenge anybody to actually see a bee on a daffodil. I don't know, I've just never seen one and stuff. Um, and I, 
thinking about native gardens versus uh, regular or traditional gardens. I mean, people who plant gardens love plants, love the outdoors, love the beauty, the the serenity, the joy that that those things bring, you know, working, getting your hands in the dirt and all. Those things are in common, but then the similarities kind of stop. Um, for the most part, a traditional garden, generally speaking, is all about appearances. It's the people, people think, ooh, I look at this color. Look at this nice red, the plant that has used to have green leaves. Now it's got red leaves. I'm going to get some of those um, because they've been genetically altered and nothing can use those red leaves really. Or, or their people are attracted to things that are out of the ordinary or different. Um, so they'll, they'll go for uh, blossoms that are, that are different, they're enhanced, they're different colors, different species of plants than maybe their neighbors have. They want they want their garden to stand out and be different. And you can kind of get into this um, keeping up with the Jones, Joneses effect. Um, with a, a natural garden, you if you if you stop and really look at what you're doing and you begin to learn, if you read some of Ptolemy's principles and the what he's saying, you start to see the connections between things and you start to realize that everything, all living things are so interconnected and interdependent in surprising ways. And once you realize that, and you realize what's going on in the world with insects and birds and climate change and all the things that, that are happening, then it really begins to matter and you want to respond, you want to make a difference somehow. And having a native garden is one way to do that. I mean, you can provide food and water for wildlife year round. The plants you plant can help do that. They can help provide habitat year round, not just not just cut flowers for a bouquet and, and not something that you have to keep immaculately trimmed and manicured and all. That's that's not that's not nature. That's that's this perception, this Western mindset that we have developed and all that just doesn't really apply. Um, carbon sequestration, whatever form it takes is a good thing anymore. Uh, the watershed value, whatever you can do, even on your own piece of property to keep erosion in check and keep all the sediment from washing into where, where it ends up in Fush Creek around here. Um, it makes your patch of land that much healthier to have all these plant roots in it, holding it together. Um, and you, the joy and delight that you get probably changes. And yes, you can still feel like for me, I go out, if I sometimes I just have to get away for five minutes and I'll go sit in the yard and look at the bees on what was technically weeds on germander, okay? But they love it. There are so many bumblebees in our backyard right now. And it's just, when I when I see them, part of me is just like, ah, oh, okay, okay. They're doing their thing. None of this other stuff matters. It's the bees are what matter and this matters. So that's that's a really good thing. It's, it's a good retreat to have. And then how you take that from, not just into spring and summer, but then when all those things begin to die back, you've still got the same life and everything out there, the the wildlife that's depending on stuff. So what do you do with that? How do you how do you garden to take care of the the autumn and the and the winter? And I think like on the on the next slide, it talks about some of those um just some of the things that you can do you make space for those you plant plants that 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 insects need so that you know leaves that they can that they can roll up in and you leave bare spaces on the ground for them to burrow in uh you leave the leaves so that they can they can hide in it and they can overwinter that way even bees and things are in there um and you plant other things and and leave it in place so that like turtles have a place to to get partly underground, partly in leaves, partly in shrubberies and stuff. Just just look at it differently, think differently, learn all you can and plant accordingly. Um, I mean, there's just nothing in nature that's ever, ever wasted. Um, and there's so much of that that goes on in leaf litter. I think I think Lynn may have another question about about that sort of thing. 
Um, we have a slide. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I love the the bee on there because you don't you don't think about bumblebees being under the leaves, but I got them in the winter. That's one place they go. So, yeah. So whatever your your next question is is. Oh, that's what you were referring to. Sorry, sorry. I'm a little. Uh, my focus is a little off tonight. <laughs> All right. So here it comes. The next multiple choice question. So get ready. I will. <clears throat> so which of the following of all of these animals overwinter in leaf litter, litter? And bear in mind, this is leaf litter harbors way more species than are listed on this screen. This is just a tiny, tiny, tiny sampling. And in case you're thinking that maybe this is a trick question, the answer is yes, it is, because all of these animals will overwinter in leaf litter. Um, I saw a discussion on Facebook the other day about um, somebody asking what's the best kind of mulch that I should get. And a bunch of people said, oh, pine chips, pine chips. And, and I was thinking leaf litter, leaf litter, because there's already life in it. Um, and then a couple of people said leaf litter, and that started a little discussion about leaf litter. And then somebody talked about shredding leaf litter. And I thought, no, 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 you don't shred leaf litter because that's going to kill the cocoons and any adult insects, like I think morning cloak butterflies live in leaf litter as adults all winter long. It's not going to help the bumblebee queens, which we desperately need more of. So, um, so leave that leaf litter, like Xerces Society says in a bunch of other places, leave the leaves just the way they are. Uh, maybe move them somewhere, but don't shred them um, and, and don't throw them away. So um, David, this is our list of um, fall and winter garden tasks. And, and I think you're gonna, um, this is just the introduction to them. So I think you're gonna run through these for us. Thanks. Okay. Probably fall and winter is the garden has, this is probably my one of my favorite times of the year because we're coming out of the heat of the summer, but uh, it's really a good idea to begin planning those tasks now. So you have a game plan when you get to the fall and you kind of have an idea of what you wanna do, what do you wanna plant? Where do you want to plant it? Uh, if you have a lot of leaf litter, where do you want to move it? Uh, so uh, as Lynn said, leaf litter, it's the best mulch. And that is that is true. And you don't discard or destroy it. I understand that, you know, some of you may have, you know, six or eight oak trees in your backyard with, you know, 10 feet of leaves back there when they all fall. So, you know, that is an issue for sure. And, uh, I don't have that issue. We have now gotten to the point where we pretty much take care of all our leaves in our yard. Naturally, we don't really get rid of any, maybe a few of the crepe myrtle leaves. I, I sweep those up. I don't put those out, but mainly because there's crepe myrtle seeds in the leaves and, and I'm trying to limit crepe myrtles growing uh, anyway. So, but planting trees, shrubs and perennials, it's the best time to do it is now and just decide where you might want to plant, what, you know, expand your gardens. Uh, dead plants, well, herbaceous plants will die back to the ground. The plant itself is not dead, but uh, those stalks that are left actually become habitat for bees. If, if it's a pithy stem and you can break it and look at like a hole in the center of it, that's, you know, bees will be uh, nesting in there over winter. And so you really don't want to cut them back. It, you know, if I have heard that, you know, some people will cut them back and maybe live, leave 12 to 18 inches but then gather the stalks, don't discard the stalks, put them somewhere in case there's bees, you know, hibernating in there or, or living in there over winter. Uh, remove well-established non-native invasives. There's going to be some more information about that coming up. It's, the fall is a time when you really can hit the non-natives. And cut material, you can add to a brush pile. The photograph you see is our brush pile, which is it doesn't look much like a brush. There's two Christmas trees at the bottom of this thing. And <laughs> Uh -huh. the vines have grown over it and you know I keep putting stuff on there and there's but you know birds love it it's it's great uh place for them to just get away from or just 
hang out for a while, I guess, whatever birds do in uh, brush piles. But uh, we also have a, a family of garter snakes who will um, that's that's a place that they love to go. We'll see them going across the paths and just kind of poof, disappear in there or they'll come back out. It's like a little at times it's just like Grand Central for different critters in the yard going in and out. Uh, just one other thing, fall and winter, this is the time when I will build hardscape in the yard if I need to, you know, add rocks or the photograph shows where I've added a lot of river rocks. It's a place that was draining or eroding really badly uh, from runoff from these hard rains we have now. So I feel, filled it with river rock, which has kind of solved the issue. But one thing in our yard, which may apply to your yards, is we have probably four or five resident turtles. So if I'm going to build any kind of hardscape in there, I don't want to build something high that the turtles, you know, it blocks them from traveling. I try to leave the yard available completely to them everywhere. So it's something to keep in mind. <coughs> so no stairs in your garden that the turtles can't climb. No <laughs> stairs. Yeah. Okay. We have a couple questions in chat and, and some I'm gonna save until uh, later when we're talking more about related subject matter, but here's one about leaf litter. Um, Tom Utley wants to know, is there a time when leaf litter can be shredded without compromising the insect populations? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. It is. You know, the problem is, uh, by the time you get into spring and stuff is growing at that point, you know, you probably, I'm saying there's probably really no safe time to really shred the leaf litter because leaf litter is used constantly until it dissolves into soil. It, it doesn't like stop being used at some point just because there are cocoons in there because other insects are are growing underneath the leaves and, and it, there's a really a, a diverse ecosystem that's under there that's much more diverse than your yard is gonna be with plants. Uh, so I would say probably not. Uh, I don't know, Ann, do you have? No, it would seem like if the, the earlier a leaf falls, it's like, okay, nothing's using it yet, you know? But I mean, then you're depriving whatever might use it of, you know, that doesn't seem right either. All I can think of is that um, I have a friend who rakes leaves into a corner of the yard on a big tarp and then takes them if it's more than more than he can use and he will uh, bag them and give them to other people who will use them and stuff. I mean, that's it's a it's an effort, but so is having leaves put in plastic bags that then go, you know, get picked up by the city or something. It's, it's just and sometimes we we at AWS, in AWS, we did one yard that had 15 oak trees. And one of the people was real OCD about picking up every single leaf and the other one wanted to leave more and stuff. So I think they ended up doing kind of a compromise with, with um, raking some of the leaves, but leaving some of the leaves and stuff. So I mean, it's, not, it's not a perfect system. And, and anything that you can do is still, you know, a, a, a a help, a, a, a movement toward the good, you know, so. Yeah, I, I would say just use as many as you can and yeah. uh, just try to be creative as you can with them. And uh, it's like Ann said, if you've got 15 oaks in your back, you are, you know, that's gonna be hard to deal with, I think, <laughs> so. Yeah. Yes, um, but I mean, you can just get used to the leaf litter. Um, no. I, I know I, I unconsciously call it leaf litter, even though I don't think of it that way. I have, a, I think, several hundred oak trees. So obviously I am constantly awash in dead leaves. But, um, you know, all sorts of things happen on my forest floor because of those dead leaves. And, and they are there year round. So um, you, you sometimes see uh, postings that say, wait till the temperature goes above 50 degrees for several days. But I agree with David that that is actually a layer of habitat in your yard, the leaf litter. And you really should try as much as you can to leave it year round. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, so leaf litter is, you know, we really, we're, we're trying to get away from the term leaf litter, but yes, 
it's really habitat is what it is. Uh, it's the value of it is releasing nutrients into the soil. It helps keep the ground moist. With you have hard rains, it slows down the rain. It allows more of the rainwater to percolate into the soil. Uh, it provides uh, this great habitat for, well, as the slide shows, bacteria, fungi, slugs, snails, worms, uh, and other invertebrates. Uh, it's, it's a very diverse system underneath there. Soil is really the basis of our terrestrial ecosystem, and it's the thing that we really need to be protecting the most. And leaf litter, leaf habitat goes a long way to do that. It's, it becomes almost, it's like a transition zone from soil uh, through the area below the leaf litter into the area above. And that area below the leaf litter is going to have a higher moisture content, even in the heat of summer. And uh, you're going to have lots of insects scurrying around in there. And then when it gets into winter, with that leaf litter there, it becomes a source, especially as it warms up a little bit. Some days are warmer than others. And we have robins and brown thrashers. They'll toss those leaves everywhere, getting insects underneath. And it's, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a good thing to leave as much as you can. But, you know, so. Um, we've got another question. Uh, is it too disruptive to insects and animals to compost some leaf litter if there are a lot of trees on the property? And this is from Meredith Wallace. Yeah, Meredith, I, no, I, I'm going to say no because I, we have a compost, it's a hot compost. And so, you know, in a hot, hot compost, you have a nitrogen source, which is your food scraps. And I think for every one part nitrogen, you need like three parts of a carbon source, which is brown. I use excess leaves for that. That's why I'm not getting rid of any of my leaves. I do use, but it will sterilize the leaves. Any insects in there would not survive unless they come out before, you know, they, you know, the temperature gets up, get, will get them. But it, generally speaking, uh, I do use some for composting. Uh, Everything's a balance one way or another. It's, and you, you have to, you have to adjust and, do the best you can, you know. That's a really good way to look at it, I think. Right. Uh, so, and what we do, we, we look at leaves as a resource and we want to manage our resource because we know that this is good habitat. Uh, I usually use a wheelbarrow and I gather it. The area it's in now, we have a little bit of grass in the backyard, maybe 20%. Maybe or 15% of the backyard is grass, the rest is native stuff. And so I'll remove the leaves from the grassy area. The photograph on the right, we have paths throughout the yard, the backyard, and that's where I take most of them. So they become uh, paths and then uh, any extras I have, I'll just pile up somewhere because when we have a hard rain, a hard rain will just clear this path of this leaf litter or, and just move it further. Our, Lot slopes front to back, so it will move it downhill. I'll come back with fresh leaves and rebuild the paths. So that's how I kind of use a lot of mine, so. I really like that idea. I'm wanting to put a path in uh, on my property too. And once I move the rocks out of the way so I don't trip over them, I think I am gonna start putting leaf litter down there. So thank you for that idea. Um, somebody asked about the word herps, which up oh, is on this, slide right here. Um, herps is basically just kind of a shorthand for snakes, um, reptiles, and amphibians. So that's what a herp, like herpetology is the study of, of herps. So. <laughs> like leaf litter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And those herps do love leaf litter. Um, okay. Um, let's see. I think our next our next topic moving along is um, talking about fall planting. And we do have a couple of questions about planting as we go through this topic. So, um, Anne? Okay. Um, if you haven't ever done any gardening or if you're totally brand new, you may think, why plant in the fall? It's going to get cold in winter and blah. But um, planting things, especially if you're planting from seed or planting new young plants, anything, it's, they're going to need time for the roots to develop. 
And there's there's some adage, I don't know who said it, but it's true that that with with gardening stuff, you get kind of a three year process. You get um, first they sleep the first year, the second year they creep and the third year they leap. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you start in the fall, you've got generally, generally speaking, and some of this is getting sort of whacked because of climate change and all, but temperatures are less, you know, and and you don't have quite the same beating, blazing heat like we've had. Um, so it's it's less stressful. The roots have time to just be roots and get going. Um, precipitation is generally a little more predictable. Um, at least it used to be. We, we don't usually get the same microbursts like we do in the spring, but who knows? Um, overall, it's it's just a little gentler time. It's easier on us for sure to be out in the fall tending plants or doing whatever needs to, to be done than it is in the summer and all. But um, there's also, for the plants, there's less competition from predatory insects and weeds, all of that's beginning to change. The weeds are, are they're not at their most aggressive taking over everything stage. They're, they're also dying back. So um, if it's the, if it's the very first year for whatever plant it is you're planting, if it's a little one that's already a seedling or something, or if it's from seed, for sure, the next, in the spring, it's not going to do much. It's not going to be like, here I am, big blooming plant, you know, it's going to still be a little plant. But um, it's kind of like you've given it a jump start by by giving it an, almost like an extra growing season. If it can come out in the spring and have a good root stru structure under it, it's going to be that much healthier as it goes on and, and gets older. It's, you know, it's not an ironclad rule. You can plant at other times of the year and water like crazy and take care of things. But but just in general, fall is a really good time because of the roots for for everything, trees, shrubs, perennials, whatever you've got. Um, and also just depending on what you're planting, um, some things that that do bloom in the spring say, that's good. You need some early blooming things in a native garden because there are a lot of pollinators that come out early and they're hungry. They need things to feed on and and uh, they don't need to wait till April or May when more things start popping out. So you need some really early blooming things to help sustain that part of the, the insect population too. So does that, does that, you have anything else to add to that or is that? enough you think yeah. okay. um, that plant by the way if you don't recognize it on the left is a turk's cap um, and they are a fall blooming plant they will uh, these are from my garden and they bloomed until december last year till the first really hard frost um, they were just blooming away uh, hummingbirds are attracted to them and um, it's a drought tolerant, shade tolerant plant. Um, it's it's a great plant to have. Um, so uh, we had some planting questions. Let's see. Do we plant? This is from um, Karen uh, Tietmeyer. Do we plant wildflower seeds in fall or spring? Nature does it in fall, as did I. But birds, squirrels, etc., feasted on them. Very few came up in spring. A, garden, a gardening failure story uh, of which we could probably share many ourselves. Go ahead. Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 always, uh, you know, I have failures going on and we both do outside right now. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, seeds, what I do uh, with native seeds is I plant them in the fall and I I have a separate container that I use and I can put like four runs of four different types of seeds. And you really want to plant them in the fall because a lot of native seeds need a cold period. We call it stratification. And if you go ahead and plant in the fall, it gets the stratification in the winter and then in the spring, it's ready to go. Uh, yes, you're going to get some predation. You're going to lose some, might lose them all. I mean, that's, that's a possibility too, but you know you have to realize native plants produce vast quantities of seeds. So uh, you know if I got an have an aster out there with thousands of seeds on it, it only needs one to come back to replenish the population. So 
it is a it is an issue, but I think if you're persistent, plant in the fall and just you know maybe can kind of cover your planter a little bit and uh, good luck. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can try some of both. I mean, try starting right. some inside to get little seedlings going. Try planting some outside. I mean, I know most people are busy and have limited time, but you know, plant extras for, <laughs> for what you know you'll lose. And, yeah, you can get you the know. cold stratification by just put them in your refrigerator and yes. then in spring plant them is another option, like in plants where you can watch them better. So, yes. And for, for any plant, pretty much if you search it on the internet about germination, you'll find instructions for, for what it needs to grow from seed. Um, that's not hard to find these days. It used to be a lot harder to find. Um, here's another question. Uh, what is the great, the great reference or link you can share showing a calendar of what to grow when? Mm. Something like the farmer's almanac. Mm. Um, I would say, first of all, um, we're growing perennials pretty much in our gardens. And so once we plant them, we hope that they're going to be there forever. Um, so it's not like vegetable growing, you know, where you say, you know, you're going to sow this uh, around President's Day and this later after the ground has warmed. Um, it's, it's, you can pretty much plant any time, although we do think the best time to plant is in the fall. Um, now, what, what you may be thinking of is a bloom calendar. And that is a calendar that will show you when flowers will bloom um, during the year. And that is a really handy thing to have. It's really important to a natural gardener because we're trying to provide nectar and pollen from the very beginning of March or even earlier through to you know, the last part of the year for all of the different bee species and butterfly and moth species. Um, have you all? I think Arkansas Native Plant Society has a bloom calendar, doesn't it? Anna, David, do you know? I do not know. I, I don't know. I usually just kind of piecemeal things together. And I, that's part of what AWS does is make recommendations based on your particular... Kind of little mini bloom calendars. Yeah, yeah. For stuff. yeah. But you can Google that yourself and, and put things together. But as far as one master site, I don't know. And there's so yeah. many different places that they come from you sort of have to I, yeah I think it's great I, I, for me you know I'm too bad about doing the trial and error method and so, <laughs> so but uh, one uh, statement I wanted to make it's real important to understand the light in your yard where you have mm -hmm. full sun part sun or shade you know full sun is six hours or more part sun is three to six hours shade is three hours or less because when you plant these plants, like the Turk's cap is a shade loving plant, you want to make sure you're matching light requirements and moisture requirements to your plant. Your success will be much greater if you do that. And I, we know that from experience. So, um, there, are, uh, there are several lists of plants that you can find if you look on the internet. There's one called Arkansas Pollinators and Actually, I have it here in hand. It's published by, um, I think, Arkansas Game and Fish. And it lists plants that pollinators love, and it lists them by when they bloom. And it also tells you what kind of growing conditions they need. And it's a, it's a fairly long list. Um, if you go to any of Heather Holmes' uh, information, H-O-L-M, she lists plants for bees and gives, you know, when they bloom and also growing conditions. So those are some places on the internet that you can go to um, for that kind of information. Um, let's see uh, what we have here. Um, Turk's cap uh, from Frank Meeks. Hi, Frank. Turk's cap blooms are edible and give a splash of color to salad. I did not know that. That's good to know. Thank you. Yes. Um, AWS is amazing. Yes, I agree. AWS is amazing. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, I think for now, uh, we're good. So let's let's move on. 
Um, this is another area where natural garden really differs in a big, huge way um, from traditional gardening. And that is cutting back, uh, cutting back dead plants. So um, first of all, and this is a pretty specific slide and I'll get to it in a minute. But first of all, native grasses. If you have native grasses in your yard, should you be cutting those back? Uh, because as Americans, of course, we all cut our grass as often as possible. Um, and the answer is no, you don't cut your native grasses back. Why not? Because during the winter time, small animals and birds will use them for cover and shelter. Insect eggs will overwinter on them. Birds will eat the seeds. Um, so cut them back just before the new grass starts growing, but not until then. And for other types of flowering plants, it's best to leave the seeds, heads, and foliage for the same reason. Basically, uh, seed-eating birds are going to come along and eat, eat that. Um, so you don't want to deprive them of that. When we're talking about plants with pithy stems, um, then we have a whole other issue. And that is uh, certain species of bees. So... Um, what kinds of plants have pithy stems? And, and now we are on the slide. There are some examples here, Joe pie weed, elderberry, wild bergamot, wing stem, cup plants. Uh, somebody else suggested rose plants, but roses aren't native. So I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, there is, I think there is one rose species that is native um, that very few people have. So, um, but um, what you need to do with these is they will be used kind of over a three-year period, or they are necessary over a three-year period. Year, year one is the year the plant is growing. So I've got cup plants growing in my front yard right now. At the, at the end of the growing season, so probably sometime in January or February, I will go outside and cut those back to 12 to 18 inches high. That's year one. In year two, in the summer, spring, summer, and fall, bees will use those pithy stems for nests for their larvae. And the larvae won't emerge until year three, okay? They'll overwinter in those stems. So, um, so this, is, this is what you do with stems, but you don't cut them back down in year two. <laughs> because the larvae will still be inside them. And I've given you the link here at the very bottom of the slide. This comes from uh, Tufts University website. So, um, so that is what you need to do if you have pithy stems. And the best thing to do is, you know, just never cut them at all, um, in, or sorry, never get rid of them at all. Keep them cut back and they'll just gradually disintegrate. They'll also be surrounded by your new growing green plant each year. So you won't really see them. Um, I can't really see the stems that I cut back last year right now because the green of the new plants is all around them. Um, so uh, David and Ann, you wanna, um, wanna make any comments here? <laughs> well, a, a two, I guess that that slide is is from our backyard, and it's a conglomeration of various pithy stems, and then some really woody. Some were come from cut plants. Uh, some of the wood, I don't remember now. But we use the wooden ones um, just as as stakes when something is, you know, some some mass of cone flowers is trying to lunge. You know, we can kind of tie it up a little bit. It, it helps. So anyway, and we kind of like the way it looks and spiders make webs in it and it's all good. Yeah. Um, the other thing about the, the, on the slide, it says, ignore that tidying instinct. I have learned or am learning <laughs> still and stuff, but we were, um, our backyard is just a constant, will always be a work in progress. But anyway, I was, I was in a mood one day and, and we had, we had gotten some new plants a few weeks before and planted them and everything. And, and I decided, okay, this is the day I'm going to go clean that bed. That's by the, by close to the pond and I'll just get it back in shape. It's getting overgrown with stuff. So by gum, I did, I pulled up the swamp milkweed, um, <laughs> didn't even notice until David said later, 
where's the swamp milkweed? And I was like, where's my <laughs> yeah, where's your, yeah. Where's sorry. So, I mean, it's only been three years, but yeah. I remember the swamp milkweed incident. Yeah. So anyway, and, and, and really I just try, it's, it's like something you have to sort of unlearn. I'll go, you know, go clean a kitchen cabinet, but leave the yard alone. So anyway. Um, by my, uh, by my clock here on my little phone, we have eight minutes left and we have a couple questions. So I would say let's answer the questions first and then let's race through the rest of the slides. How does that sound? Good. Okay, so um, the first question is, um, some neighbors of Ann Bleed were talking about planting bamboo. No, 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 to create a visual barrier between their house and a housing development. Can you suggest some native trees to plant instead of bamboo? And Steve Hyatt, hi Steve, suggested river cane, um, which is native. Um, bamboo, horrible idea. Um, there's one species of bamboo that I think can um, make running roots under the surface for like 40 feet, over 40 feet. You'll never get rid of it if you plant it. So do not plant bamboo. Even, even the better species is still horrible. It's a non-native, it's incredibly invasive. It's incredibly hard to remove. Um, any recommendations? I would suggest an ilex of mm. some sort, the, uh, a holly, like ilex vomitoria. decidua, ilex vomitoria. Mm. Um, they make, you can shape them whatever you they're want evergreen. them to be, and they're evergreen or can yeah. be, um, they're, and they, they grow well here. Yeah, they got, you know, I think they will get around 15 feet, maybe 20 feet, so, so it could make a great yeah. so. A They've started springing up wild on my property. Vomitoria is um, yapon, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, Yapon. So Yapon Holly, a, a good pick. Um, that's a great idea. Uh, should we keep plants from the spring Audubon sale in their containers until fall? Can they stay in containers that long? I have kept plants in containers <laughs> that long. So yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, the thing is, though, I would say two things. One, you're going to have to water them every day because those pots are tiny. And two, if the plant is really root bound, I would take it out and put it in a bigger pot because some of the plants that you'll get at that Audubon sale are extremely root bound. And I would feel bad about leaving one in a pot for that long. But you can repot it in a bigger pot and you'll, you'll be fine. Um, let's see, should beautyberry be cut back? And if so, when? Uh, beautyberry, I, we've cut it back before. We'll cut it back to the ground because it will come back. And I think the berries are all new growth. They're correct. Not, the old growth is not going to have them. So that's correct. So, yes. So yeah, I would say cut them back. So yeah, I, I have as many beauty berries as I have oak trees, and you absolutely can can cut them back. And when uh, when the berries are gone, wait till the berries are gone because you've got wildlife eating those berries. So you know maybe end of January, beginning of February, before the new growth starts. Um, let's see. Okay, I think we're through the questions. We've got a lot of comments though, and thank you everybody for these comments. This is great. Um, one of the best parts of these webinars. We've got five minutes, so let's race through these slides. Here's an easy one. This is just pictures of the most prevalent invasive non-natives. And talking about um, removing non-natives in fall and winter, um, Here's a list of some, not all. Notice that bamboo is not on the list. Um, maybe because you can't remove it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, David and Ann, do you want to say anything about removing invasive non-natives? Yeah, I think those listed are the most common. There are plenty others as well, but those are the most common that you will, that we would find when we do AWS visits 
you know, these are the ones we find most often. Yeah. So Nandina is is harmful because its berries, although they're beautiful, are toxic. They're cyanide. They're they're bad for pets. They're bad for people. Bad for birds. Birds will eat them when they're desperate, and it's still not good for them. So if you can't get rid of the whole plant, and some and you can, but it's hard sometimes. At least cut the berries off once they bloom. Cut the blooms off. Just, yeah. Just you know, and and <laughs> do what you can to. It will eventually respond to to being treated mean over a period of years but anyway basically when we're talking about removal there's just a few ways to do it um you can smother it you know if you've got like a flat area uh, of invasive non-natives and you want to kill them all you can um, paint the leaves with poison if it's a tree or shrub you can cut it off close to the ground you need to do this in the fall though not any other time of year and paint the stump um and kill it uh or uh pull it out with your little hands um i've done that with a ton of ivy um david and ann you used a uh weed eater a, a weed eater a weed eater on this ivy in the picture right yeah but just to get it down and then you still have to pull it out but at least it was too thick to smother so uh. yeah you, you you do have to be careful i mean i've heard of people running over with a lawnmower i would never do that because you don't know what's in there but there's a, if there's a turtle or a snake in there you know what's going to happen even with the weed eater you have to be cautious uh and uh, but it's it's working well for us because if you can just expose the roots, it's fairly easy to pull up. It's shallow rooted for the most part. So. Patience, persistence, yeah. and and a son that's willing to help. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I also had a son willing to help me, and I was able to get rid of over twenty uh, privet trees this winter. Um, cut them off uh, as as close to ground level as I could with the saw in the picture and then painted them with the poison. And this is the poison that I used. Regular Roundup won't work. It's not poisonous enough, believe it or not. You have to get something smaller or stronger than regular Roundup. And this stuff I bought at Home Depot. And it, you know, if you look on the internet, you can find instructions. I've given you a link on this screen. Um, so, um, We've got two minutes left. So do you want to, um, let's see, okay. How do you smother a plant? We don't really have enough time to talk about that tonight, but look up uh, smothering plants with cardboard. Uh, it's it's usually um, in a prairie situation that you're gonna smother things. You, you wanna plant prairie plants and you've got already growing plants there, most of which are not native. So you're looking to smother. Would vinegar work on ivy? Um, vinegar is poison. And so you really shouldn't put vinegar um, out there in nature because it will harm plants and animals other than the ivy, in addition to the ivy. Um, so any last words in our last minute? Um, I just think the best thing we were going to talk about mosquitoes and I think people might like to know that even Disney world, uh, they don't use mosquito Joe. Don't use mosquito Joe. Mosquito Joe kills like everything, not just mosquitoes. <laughs> but if you get a bucket of water and put some hay or straw in it and in two days time, add a, uh, mosquito dunk, you can go Google it, look up. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. I a B C I B T I put a dunk in there that smells great to the females mosquitoes she'll come lay eggs and that's it because nothing will grow in it they won't grow just get it's, it's brilliant it's genius and you don't pay a lot of money for it like you would mosquito joe and kill the other things you're trying to support yeah in so and, and the dunks last for 30 days which is great yeah. you can get granules if you'd rather have that so anyway but yeah good point we didn't get to cultivars but um we'll talk about that at the next Ask the Natural Gardeners if there is one, and it is on the slides, so you can come and look at the recording. Um, and well, no, you won't be able to see them on the recording. If I sent you the PowerPoint, you would see them. But um, in just in general, just one word about cultivars before we go, and that is uh, be careful. There are legitimate concerns about cultivars. A few are more attractive to pollinators. 
Um, but uh, many, many, many are less attractive and um, don't do anything for pollinators at all. So I think we've exceeded our time by a minute or two. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm seeing your messages in chat. Um, we're so pleased that you could join us. Um, we love these exchanges of information. Um, and uh, friend me on Facebook. Uh, I'm Lynn Foster, and I'll get you those slides. Uh, David and Ann. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Thank you, everybody. Thank so. you. Happy thank you. <laughs> yeah, take care. All right. Thanks, everybody. And good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.